Chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus says this. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should go out and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the work which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened, that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. Chapter 16, verse 1. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things will, they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them, and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Let's pray. Father, there's, there's a lot here. It's heavy. Lord, we, we, we came here this morning to, to, to bless you. And Lord, I believe, we believe that we can't bless you if we pass over some scripture that that you have every intention of us to hear and live out. Scripture that may be hard to hear. Scripture that we may want to avoid, Lord. It's for our good. We thank you for it. Lord, I praise you. Just praise you for the worship we've had already. And it's all, it's our desire and request, prayer request, that by the end of this service, we will be worshiping you with even wider, broader hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. So here we are, John chapter 15, just a few hours before Jesus is arrested, bound, tried, crucified. It is after the Last Supper. Judas has uh, left to betray him. He is giving his disciples all of his heart. He's pouring out his last words to them. These disciples that he loves so much and he's sharing with them because he loves them. But oh man, are these last verses of chapter 15 and the first verses of chapter 16 heavy. The word hate. Hate, a heavy word, hate, used seven times from verses 18 to 25. Verse 18 says, if the world hates you. 
It actually, more properly translated, when the world hates you. <laughs> when the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You and, and Jesus doesn't stop there. He continues with the same theme right through the end of the chapter into the first four verses of chapter 16. So we have spent three Sundays in verses 1 through 15, three, uh, three Sundays. And what did he say in those verses? Well, they were meant, among other things, to prepare the disciples for what they were going to hear in verse 18 and beyond, that heavy message. When they hate you, know that they hated me first. He's preparing them in the first 17 verses. What did we hear? Abide in me. Never break off that relationship with me, that unending, continuous, flowing, fully shared relationship with me. Abide in me. Never stop abiding. Then he goes on preparing them, and he says in verse 15, he says, no longer do I call you servants, I call you friends. I call you friends. And again, we talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, only one man before this point in the Bible. There's a lot of pages before this point. Look at this. A lot of pages. Only one time was any man ever called a friend of God. Who was that? Abraham. And here in, in, in John chapter 15, Jesus is saying, every man, woman, or child who gives their heart to the crucified, resurrected king... Jesus is calling friend. You are my friend. No longer do I call you a servant. You are my friend. He's preparing them. He's preparing his disciples for the life that is ahead of them. He's preparing them for what he's going to say to them in verses 18 through the end of the chapter and into the first four verses of, of chapter 16. He's preparing them. When the world hates you, know that it hated me first. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Now, again, what does he say to prepare them. Number one, well, you, you can never stop abiding. Number two, remember you are, when you're in that situation, uh, uh, you are my friend. And number three, what does he say? Uh, verse 16, you did not choose me. Just let this sink in. Oh, how the body of Christ resists this word in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. So important in a time of trial where we, you, are being hated for what you believe that you remember. Jesus' words, you did not choose me, but I chose you. So again, what is going on here? Jesus knows that in the light that is ahead of him, from time to time, there will be a flood of doubt and fear. Psalm 93, verse 3, says this. Been really chewing on this verse this weekend. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their waves. This, the floods here are referring to the flood of fear and doubt and trials that is part of the life of every follower of God who is obedient to Jesus. When that flood of doubt and fear is coming in and you're thinking, can I really live this life that God has called me to? I'm really 
Am I really qualified to live it? Surely I'm not good enough. Surely I'm not holy enough. Surely I'm not faithful enough, courageous enough, strong enough. Jesus, knowing that this is going to happen to these men, he, knowing that it's going to happen to you if you're obedient to him. Remember verse 14 says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you to do. If, if you're doing what Jesus commands you to do, that flood, fear and doubt is going to come in. And Jesus, knowing that will be happening and preparing them for that time, he says, you do, did not choose me, I choose you. Why is he saying this? Well, he knew where they began their relationship with God. He knew, he, Jesus knows where you began, where you were at spiritually, emotionally, when you began your relationship with Jesus. Now, there may be some exceptions here. I'm so, I certainly am not an exception to this, that when I began my relationship with Jesus, and, and most in this room, you, when you began your relationship with Jesus, you were thinking something like, I think I'd like to choose a life with Jesus. I think I would like that. I think I'm good enough. I, I think I can be holy enough. I think I can be faithful enough, courageous enough, strong enough. Yes, so yes, Jesus, I choose you, Jesus. That's what happened with most of you. But then the trial of life comes, that comes by obeying Jesus. It comes in like a flood, the flood that's lifted up its voice, the flood that's lifted up its mighty waves. And what is the voice of this flood? What's the voice of doubt? I was wrong. I can't be good enough. I can't be holy enough. I can't be faithful enough. I can't be courageous enough, strong enough. What a fool I was. To ever think I was good enough to choose Jesus and walk in this calling. So knowing the flood would come with those voices, Jesus says this, these words, to be branded, burned into your soul. You did not choose me. Stop that. Get that out of your mind. I chose you. The verse continues, and appointed you that you should go bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give you. So he, he, he's speaking to them in the final hours of his life. He, he, he's also speaking to them really in the future uh, to when that flood, fear and doubt, comes in. He's speaking to you this morning. You didn't choose me. I chose you. So get up. You've fallen down. Get up. Go out and bear fruit. Don't give up. And by the way, he's saying, forget Never forget, rather, never forget that you can call on Almighty God in the midst of this trial, and whatever you ask in his name, he will give you. God is mightier than the flood. So Psalm 93, verse 4, the next verse says this, the Lord on high is mightier, and underline that, mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea, than the flood. He's my ear. And when you call upon him, he answers. Verse 17 continues. Let's continue. Jesus preparing them for what they're going to hear in verse 18 and beyond. He says, these things I command you that you love one another. That you love one another. So we spent a lot of time in our study of First Peter. It's a little dated now. It was a few years ago. But when 
we go through suffering, what's the first thing that leaves in our life? Anyone want to shout it out? Please do. What's the first thing that goes? Love. Oh, that was good. Who said that? I'm impressed. Love is the first thing so often that goes. We learn this from 1 Peter, which is all about you are called to suffering. First thing that goes, love. Jesus is saying, do not let that happen to you when the flood of trial comes in. You need to love one another. Do not stop loving one another. And then he comes to verse 18. Again, if when the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you, is what he says. Jesus preparing his disciples for his departure. So now, if you've been with us in the study of John, you would know that I could carry on for a real long time, a long, long time, about how Jesus makes it as clear as clear can be that the man or woman who gives their life to, to Jesus and walks with them is promised a rich, abundant, blessed life. They're promised that, and it is a living reality. I've been walking with the Lord now for 30 years, and that's as true as true gets. God will bless you as you follow him. We spent an entire morning on John chapter, just two verses in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. Jesus declares, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that's a good thing. That is a good, good thing. And then, of course, John chapter 10, verse 10, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I have come, Jesus says, that you might have life and that you would have it to the fullest, more abundantly. John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, I give you my peace. Everyone who comes to me, I give you my peace. We were introduced to John chapter 15 with Jesus' famous declaration, actually in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where he says, come to me, all you who are heaven laden, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Man, is the world running after rest and peace or what? That is a promise from Jesus to you. And here in John chapter 15, Jesus promises strength and joy as we abide, as we live in him. But brothers and sisters, all of that, if you're taking notes, write this down. All of those things will be in the midst of hostility from the world, not apart from hostility from the world. All the blessings, the strength, the, 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 the joy, the peace, the abundant life, the, the prosperity, and he prospers in many ways, will be in the midst of hostility from the world, not apart from it. As I was preparing this message, I, I did feel like the Lord wanted me to focus on this. They persecuted me. They will persecute you when... The world hates you. Remember that it hated me. As I was preparing for it, I ran across this quote from J.C. Ryle. He was an uh, evangelical Anglican bishop. 
in the 1800s, he said this, J.C. Ryle, if there's anything that true Christians seem to always forget, this is a modern translation, by the way, and always need to be reminded of, it is the true feeling of unbelievers towards them and the treatment they must expect from them. So it's interesting, this incredibly renowned scholar and preacher an author is saying, if there's anything Christians always need to be reminded of, it's that the true feeling of the unbeliever towards them. It's hate. Why is it that we forget this? Why is it that we always have to be reminded of this? Why is it that Jesus is closing up his last words with them with these words? When the world hates you. Well, I don't have all the answers. I think one reason is that God made us to be social beings. Social, we're social, meaning we, we like being together. We have a, a strong desire to live in happy relationships with other men and women around us. And the last thing we want to be is a, a social outcast not accepted by other people. We do not like that. But Jesus doesn't let us keep our heads in the sand like an ostrich on this one. He says that when the world hates you, verse 18, know that it hated me before you. He says if you were of the world, verse 19, um, the world would love its own, but you're not of the world, and therefore, that's why the world hates you. Eek! I'm glad we study chapter by chapter at Calvary Chapel. I, I would probably choose to skip over these verses if we didn't do that. I could very well. Time and again throughout my Christian life, the Lord has had to tell me, Steve, stop resisting this. You can't follow me and be loved by everyone. Quit trying to do that. Time and time again, from the beginning to the end of my walk, the Lord, Steve, stop resisting this. Oh, man, does my flesh recoil, push back this thought that I'm called to be hated. Wow. How we love, how I love. I don't want to speak with, for all of you how I love the praise of men. How, we're addic how, how I'm addicted to it. I'm going to throw off that addiction minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. The praise of men. And Jesus gives us so many promises to bring strength and joy to our hearts, but he never... There's never a promise that if we walk with him, we will have the praise of men. You'll never see that promise. You will see the opposite, 2 Timothy 3.12. Anyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus. Sean, do we have that? All who desire to live a godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And that means you, unless you insist on living your Christian life in a cave. Again, I'm struck by J.C. Ryle's, J.C. Ryle's quote. Let's look at it again. It says this. It says, if there is anything that true Christians seem always to forget... <laughs> And always need to be reminded of it is the feeling of unbelievers towards them and the treatment they must expect from them. Listen, there's a very dangerous theology. A theology, that word means study of God or teaching of God, teaching about God. There's a very dangerous theology, a wildly popular one, including uh, churches in this city. And it goes something like this. 
God is love. Jesus is love. If there is a response to the message about Jesus, therefore, that is anything other than a loving response, something must be wrong with the message or the messengers because Jesus is love. So if someone hears me preach up here and they respond in any other way than love, if they get angry, if they get offended, that's not love because Jesus is love and I need to change my message. Wildly popular. In this city. Talking about heaven is okay because most people have a warm, loving response to that. Talking about hell is not. So you leave that out of the message. And so talking about God's love is okay Talking about God's judgment is not. Talking about what exactly the Bible teaches on sexual orientation, gender identity, whether life begins at conception, cannot be part of the message because people respond with anger. And they don't respond with love, and Jesus is love. So how can that possibly be part of Jesus' message? So I have two comments about this. Two comments about this theology. Number one, yes, Jesus is love, but to stay away from any topic that is clearly addressed by Jesus is not love. That's not love. When a loved one, or a perfect stranger for that matter, or a person visiting a church, our church, is on the broad road that leads to destruction. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus said, wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Wide is the way, uh, narrow rather, is the way that leads to life, and there are few that find it. To not point out to a loved one or a perfect stranger or to you who happen to be visiting today that you're on the broad road that leads to destruction, that's not Love. That's not love. My second comment about this theology, the theology that says if anyone responds to my message in a way other than love, that means I need to change my message. Well, I don't see how anyone could uh, uh, live by this theology who calls himself a Christian and make it through the book of John. How in the world do you teach this and read through this book? I, I, I mean... <laughs> uh, from chapter 5 on they're plotting to kill Jesus because of what he said and in the end they do they kill him that's not a loving response so hear, hear, hear me out here we may not be killed but we are no exception. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you to come out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Brothers and sisters, don't try to squirm out of this one. The world's going to hate you <laughs> if you follow Jesus. Darkness hates the light. The Bible teaches that the world is shrouded in darkness. And, and so, by the way, just in case some of you are actually feeling comfortable now, just because Jesus is referring to the world doesn't mean that you are protected from hatred right inside what's called the Christian church. Look at chapter 16, verse 4. It says this, But these things I have told you that when the... Uh, rather, verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. They'll put you out of church. They, they will hate you right inside the church. They'll hate you. When born-again Christians in the mid-1800s, such as Charles Spurgeon and Charles Finney, called out slavery as a sin, they were hated by the church. They were kicked out of the church. Spurgeon's, all his, his sales of all his sermons, if you've never read his sermons, please do. The sales of all his printed sermons were banned in the South. Finney was not even allowed in portions of the country which were pro-slavery. And don't think it's not in 2018. Listen, if you get up in a pulpit and you teach that you need to love and minister to immigrants... 
with mercy and acts of kindness. I'm not talking about immigration policy, what the government should or shouldn't do. I'm talking about the clear teaching of Scripture, of the Word of God, Leviticus 19, 33, and 34. If a stranger, an immigrant, dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. That's heavy stuff. But if you teach that in a pulpit in the United States of America, many evangelical churches will hate you. They will hate you. Okay, is everyone feeling uncomfortable now? So, so now pause. I, I'm hoping you're with me on this one. I'm hoping you're with me. But listen, listen what I'm, to what I'm not saying and, and also... I talked about a couple weeks ago what drives pastors crazy. I'm going to bring up another thing that drives me personally crazy. Here's what drives me crazy. It's when I see Christians and they accept this verse. Okay, I get it. If I faithfully follow Jesus, sooner or later I'm going to be persecuted. They accept it. But then they, they turn around and they respond to persecution in a completely unchristlike manner. Do you notice here, what, what do I mean by that? Do you notice here that Jesus doesn't make any apologies whatsoever? So you're going to be hated. Oh, by the way, and I apologize for that, guys. I'm really sorry for that. Jesus doesn't make any apologies. And, and yet, how often, you know, you pull up Facebook and some, some article goes out about someone who's thrown out of a class because they had a Bible in their class. Oh, look what's happening. Woe is me. They're shooting at us. <laughs> is that Christ? Is that Jesus? I, I, I love what Spurgeon says about this. He says, look, save yourself pretty for those who... Everyone is, the Christians that everyone is speaking well about them because Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6, verse 26, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Woe, meaning something really bad's going to happen. If all men speak well of you, for they did the same thing with their fathers, the false prophets. Oh my, that's heavy stuff. Look. I'm not saying that there's not a proper place to advocate for Christian liberty. There is, and faithful Christians do it. But it is such an outrageous misrepresentation of Jesus to be sobbing around like a two-year-old screaming kid, look what they're doing to us. On the contrary, what should they be doing? Anyone want to shout it out? Rejoice! What did Jesus say in Matthew 11, ver, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 11? Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice! Be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice! I want to see that Facebook post. You have my permission to do that post, by the way. Look what happened. This Christian got kicked out of school. Let's all praise God with him. That's a legitimate biblical response. Let me close with, let me close with this. Again, it says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Christian, the world will tolerate you if you're a lukewarm believer. If you're lukewarm. The world will tolerate a little sprinkling of Jesus. A little sprinkling, just sprinkle a little Jesus on top of your life. The world will be okay with you if you're doing business like the world, if you're doing sex like the world, if you're doing entertainment like the world, it will be perfectly okay with you. But Calvary Chapel in the city, 
please don't do that. You have one life. One life. You don't want to get to the end of your life and realize, I covered up the glory of God my whole life. You don't want to do that. The Bible does say that we'll have to give an account for our life. You can email me and we can argue about that one. I know a lot of folks don't like that. It does say Christians will give an account for their life. You do not want to get to the judgment seat of Christ and give an account that includes that. You don't want that. You want to please your Lord. Isaiah 43, verse 7, we can't quote it enough. I can't quote it enough. Jesus says, Jesus is the word of God. He's speaking in the book of Isaiah. He says, everyone who is called by my name, I have created for my glory. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world, a city that is is set on a hill, cannot be hidden. Don't put a basket over the lamp of your life. Don't do it. Jesus is saying, now the good news is, verse uh, uh, 25 says this, uh, rather verse 26 says that when the helper comes, he's talking about the Holy Spirit here. When, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father He will testify of me. In other words, don't try to do it in the flesh. Don't try to do it in your own strength. Don't try to be a signpost to Jesus, a testimony to Jesus in your own strength. You'll just be obnoxious to the world. Pray to God. Pray to Jesus. I need the Holy Spirit to help me do this. I can't. Verse 27, and you also, he's speaking to you here this morning in Boston, April of 2018, you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. You will bear witness. Don't waste your life covering up the glory of God. I'm going to call the worship team up at this time, and we're just going to end with a time of worship and prayer. If you've been called to pray, Greg, what should we do with the prayer folks? Should they get on the side? Or? Yeah, that's fine. So if you're praying, if you could just, uh, if you've been asked to be a prayer couple, could you get on the side? Why don't you all rise and I will pray as they're uh, getting ready and let's ask the Lord to take these heavy words And somehow make them light. You know, I love the verse in 1 John. It says, the commandments of God are not burdensome. I love that verse. The commandments of God are not grievous, is the translation I even like more. They're not something uh, to be scared of or, or to make us grieve, to make us weep, to make us without joy. No, the commandments of the Lord are not burdensome. They are meant to give us the abundant life. Which is promised. Let's pray and then we'll worship. And if you need prayer, please come up um, when, as the worship team begins. Father, we, we, we thank you. We thank you for the word, every bit of it, Lord. We thank you. And I pray, Father, that you would transform these words, which in one sense, there's just ink dead on a page. <laughs> And you make them active, living, active, warm. And the words themselves even rejoicing in our life. I think of Acts chapter 3 and 4, which just speaks of the early disciples, the same ones, Lord, you were speaking to right here. After they were beaten, they left rejoicing. Lord, we pray that you would do that miracle in our life. We pray for that. And Lord, I just pray, Father, that we'd leave here today 
not abandoning these words, but erasing them. We don't want to cover up your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.